everyone, and welcome to the Heritage Foundation. I'm Andrew Parks, the Assistant Director of Internal Programs here at the Heritage Foundation. I just wanted to thank you all for joining us and uh, in the Lewis Lehrman Auditorium today. Uh, just so you're aware, there are copies of the book available outside the auditorium. If you have not gotten one, make sure to pick one up. Additionally, the authors will be available to sign copies following the program here on stage. Uh, next, I just wanted to make a brief introduction for our moderator of today's program, Tim Gagline. He is the Vice President of External Relations at Focus on the Family. With that, Tim. Good afternoon, everybody. It seems altogether fitting that we are meeting in the shadow of the 75th anniversary of D-Day and Operation Overlord. And it seems rather unbelievable and even a little unlikely that around six and a half years ago, Alan and I were having breakfast here in Washington at the famed uh, Hay Adams Hotel. And I had invited to our breakfast clatch uh, two of the most well-known Eisenhower experts in the United States. Uh, both of them with a long uh, published pedigree, uh, one more academic, one uh, more of a popular writer, but both fully within the canon of the uh, Eisenhower Orv and the whole idea of World War II and what was happening in Eisenhower's life quite literally uh, in the years before he was born, uh, going to middle age and until the many years uh, after Eisenhower had passed away. And in our nearly hour and a half uh, time together, uh, it was remarkable to learn the depth of detail uh, that these men had dedicated a significant part of their professional lives to. In fact, uh, one of our guests that morning, uh, that morning uh, told us with great humility that he felt uh, over the life of his career that it was probable that he had read uh, most all of the correspondence and uh, letters uh, of, uh, of Eisenhower himself. Uh, this was uh, nearly jaw-dropping and very impressive. Uh, and uh, before the tip and tax were paid, uh, Alan Sears uh, rather sheepishly asked uh, both men, uh, what about President Eisenhower's faith? And there was a very odd quietude. And um, Alan had not said one of George Carlin's seven dirty words. And so we, 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 we picked up the conversation again. Uh, and I uh, sort of echoed what Alan had said. I said to one of the two men who, uh, by the way, not on Eisenhower, but on another president, had just published a rather uh, uh, important book. And, and I said, no, just in light of what, uh, of what Alan has asked, we are just curious about uh, the depth or width or breadth of, uh, of President Eisenhower's faith. And uh, almost uh, in communion, these men looked at each other and they said, you know, that's uh, one area, and I'm, I'm quoting one of the two in air quotation marks, that has not been sufficiently explored. And after our breakfast together, uh, Alan turned to me and he said, uh, perhaps we should sufficiently explore this area. <laughs> and so, born of this breakfast uh, is the book uh, that we hope that you and all 50,000 of your best friends will buy. Uh, it is the soul of an American president, the untold story of Dwight D. Eisenhower's faith, uh, by co-authors Alan Sears and Craig Oston. While there have been many biographies of Dwight D. Eisenhower that focus on his military career or the time uh, as president, none really clearly explore the important role that faith played both in his personal life and in his public policy. Uh, this despite the fact that he is the only U.S. president to be baptized as a Christian while in office. By the way, I, I might uh, encourage those who have never seen it or read it uh, that you take a look at President Eisenhower's first inaugural, 
uh, you know, this is Ike. And he comes to address the nation in his, uh, in his ina first inaugural speech, and as you're going to hear, invites the nation to pray. It's quite a remarkable moment in the history of the U.S. presidency. Alan Sears and Craig Oston invite all of us on a journey that is unique in American history and is essential, and I underscore this, essential to understanding one of the most consequential, admired, and complex Americans of the entire 20th century. The story begins in abject poverty in rural Texas, then tra uh, travels through Kansas, West Point, two world wars, and uh, right down Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, this is the untold story of a man whose growing faith sustained him through the loss uh, through the loss of a young son, marital difficulties, depression, career disappointments, and being witness to some of the worst atrocities that mankind has ever devised. A man whose faith was based in his own sincere personal conviction, as you'll learn. By the way, not out of a sense of political expediency or social obligation. This is one of the really remarkable parts of this narrative, but uh, through a very sincere and convicted faith. Uh, you've met Dwight Eisenhower, the soldier, and uh, Dwight Eisenhower, the president. Now meet Dwight Eisenhower, the man of faith. I'm very happy to say and introduce uh, both of the co-authors today uh, are with us, and we're uh, looking forward to the, the next hour together. Alan Sears serves as founder of Alliance Defending Freedom, and in his 23 years as president and CEO, Alan built an ADF team committed to a comprehensive legal strategy that includes training, funding, and legal advocacy resulting in important roles in 52 victories at the U.S. Supreme Court. That's right, 52. Sears earned his Juris Doctor from the Louis Brandeis School of Law, and while serving in numerous positions within the administrations of Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush, Allen worked for the Department of Justice under Attorneys General William French Smith and Edwin Meese III, including service as, a US, as an assistant U.S. attorney and chief of the criminal section for the Western Division of Kentucky. By the way, Eisenhower would have loved that title. And, uh, and also, I'm uh, pleased and honored to introduce uh, uh, Craig Oston. Uh, Craig Oston is a vice president of senior, and se of senior director of research and grant writing at Alliance Defending Freedom. And prior to joining ADF, Craig was the assistant to the president of Focus on the Family, where he created and managed the public policy constituent response division. He has a degree in mass communications from the University of California, Davis. And uh, I'm very uh, uh, eager to introduce both men, but uh, first, uh, Alan, in the overview of this really outstanding book. Congratulations. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Tim and uh, uh, Reverend Boyles. I just give a little kudos to you who helped us with some of the research and primary things and Ambassador. We have uh, one of the uh, ambassadors at large that served both under President Reagan and previously had served under President Dwight D. Eisenhower. So we're delighted to have you here in the audience this morning. I want to greet all of you here and those of the, are joining us by uh, means of internet and the World Wide Web. It's, uh, as Tim said, uh, we are here on the uh, cusp of uh, the memories of June 6, 1944, the 75th anniversary of that remarkable day. And uh, as several of you at the Heritage Foundation have noted, this is not just a date that's pivotal in Western civilization in all of history, but it's pivotal in terms of the formation of much of our modern world and our views of uh, freedom, of liberty, and of the ability to stand for those. Uh, this is the anniversary, of course, of the date that the American, the British, the Polish, the Canadian troops landed on that impenetrable Normandy coast in the greatest military mobilization in the history of the world. And unless you have been uh, sleeping or having had your head in the sand, you know a little bit about Normandy, you know a little bit about D-Day and what happened, 
But one of the things that I challenge many of the people I speak to across the country is to ask them if they know what the odds were of victory at the beginning, uh, at the time that D-Day took place. Very few today really know the incredibly high cost of that victory or the human toll, and very few people know even the top three or even one reason that we were able to win uh, at that time. People forget that at the beginning of this war, when, when things launched, America ranked number 17 in armies of the world. Romania was number 16 in terms of the uh, size and uh, equipage of their uh, military forces. The Allies, of course, had to engage uh, to take back Europe to save the lives of the remaining Jews and the freedom-loving peoples there, to stop national socialism, to allow freedom to flourish, but most of all, as Prime Minister Churchill and President Roosevelt put it, it was to save Christian civilization. To accomplish their mission, it required an, an equipped and prepared people because then, as now, as Heritage Foundation often says, personnel is policy. The current attacks on our faith, the same sorts of attacks that led many of our families and our ancestors to the freedom found on the shores of this new nation, seem relentless to us today, and indeed, the prospects of preserving and much less expanding freedom and rights of conscience in the United States often seem downright discouraging. With threats to religious freedom coming from all sides, from our courts, our government, and our culture, probably many of us ask ourselves at some point, how are we to persevere? How are we to persevere in hope in the face of these unpleasant realities? I submit that we persevere and we endure by understanding hope and, of course, the source of that hope. Today's story, I hope, will provide to you important lessons about hope, lessons that we can apply now as we seek to shape our future for ourselves and our nation, to please our God, and to become all that we can be. A friend of mine often says, nothing has meaning without a context, and few things provide more context than understanding our collective past, learning about and from those who persevered and kept the faith, often through circumstances that made no sense at all. Our heritage, our heritage to enable us to live in our present freedom. One of the things that we're gonna talk about as we go forward is the role model of this particular individual, of the importance of this person in seeing an example of what we need to be and do as we go forward. And I'm going to use this uh, human person, this figure of, of our heritage, who, though very imperfect, like each of us, persevered and accomplished truly good and great things because he was faithful. And he allowed God to be in charge of his life, even when he didn't like where or what he was assigned to most of his career. But because he was humble, because he was obedient, he was raised up to change the world, to be the designer of that June morning invasion 75 years ago, the foothold of the campaign to restore freedom and human flourishing in Europe. I submit his maker uniquely prepared this man to be the right person at the right time, at the right place, through a maze of personal hills and valleys, fretful problems, difficult relationships, faithful decisions, even family deaths that never made sense. But along the way, along the path, he modeled servanthood, leadership, and perseverance to ultimately become the supreme commander of the largest military force ever known to mankind, and then the 35th, 34th president of these United States. Dwight David Eisenhower, Ike, as Tim said a moment ago, was born in what the world would call complete insignificance in Denison, Texas on October 14, 1890. Facing a brutal economic downturn in Texas where his family could barely make ends meet, his family moved back to the little town of Abilene, Kansas, where Ike's grandparents lived, so his father could work doing menial labor at the family's creamery. There, Ike quietly grew up, far below what we would today call the poverty line, excelling in high school football, but very little else. But even on those forgotten, forlorn, and dusty streets of Abilene, Providence, was orchestrating events in Ike's life, events that would prepare him for the remainder of where he was to go and who he was to become. 
Ike was befriended by the local news publisher who loaned him a library of books. This young boy, who was never a very good student, was excited to learn that the world was actually bigger than the 100 yards of a football field. And it led him without any political connections from the wrong side of the tracks, as this newspaper notes, to apply for and gain a prestigious appointment for the US military class of 1915. That was the class later called the class the stars fell on, as 59 cadets from its 164 member class would later achieve the rank of general. I talked to uh, present day West Point students who are part of a class of 700 and they can't imagine uh, these statistics. But when Ike arrived at West Point, he hated the academy's then tedious teaching style. And his academy years were rough, and they got even rougher when an equestrian injury took him off the football field, the only place he had ever starred. But with sure will, with pure grit, he stuck it out and he graduated, but far from the top of his class. And then you might ask, what was it all worth? Because after graduation, he was assigned to one dull, boring, peacetime army post after another. And even when the nation entered World War I, it didn't change that at all. When the Great War broke out, Ike, like every other officer, wanted to be part of the fight for freedom. Instead, he was assigned to Camp Colt, stuck near where Pickett charged on the Civil War battlefields of Gettysburg, and there his job was to train others to go do what he wanted to do himself. He trained in the shadow of another junior officer, George Smith Patton, who, like Ike, believed that the tank, this concept Winston Churchill had dreamt up, might actually play a useful role in this and future wars. So while Patton went to France to prove the theory, Ike was left home to prepare raw recruits to try it. Still, he made the best of things. Expecting a lot from those under his command, Ike was convinced that high morale came through exacting standards of discipline and hard work, excellence. And things got pretty exacting all right. The camp had been designed to hold 4,000. It was soon crammed with 10,000, and they ran short of everything. And during an especially cold winter blizzard, Ike had to go door to door among local farmers, scrounging up stoves to keep his men from freezing to death. But despite all, under his strong leadership, morale rose, and his command soon to become not only the largest, but the top tank training center in the nation. Over seven months, his superiors recognized his remarkable efforts, and some of you who have military background know how significant this is. In that seven-month period, he was promoted from captain to lieutenant colonel. That's almost like graduating from law school after a single semester. But then the struggles came, and the life became much harder. Because when the conflict in Europe ended, Ike's reward for all this excellence was rank reduction, back to the permanent rank of captain, as the American forces shrank in size. And finally, a few months later, when he was finally promoted to major, he was stuck there for the next 16 years. Uh, no time and rank exceptions, that's just the way it was. In 1919, Ike spent two months escorting a motorized army convoy across the United States at the breathtaking pace of six miles an hour, 58 miles a day on the nation's muddy, unpaved roads, dealing with constant breakdowns, collapsing motorways, and repairing bridges before the heavy vehicles could cross them, all of this for a public relations campaign. Most tragically, two years after this convoy, Ike and Mamie lost their firstborn son, Dwight Dowd, who they'd called Ikey, from typhoid fever that Ikey had contracted from a part-time housekeeper they had hired to help Mamie while Ike was stationed at the training camp at Mead. Ike adored his little boy, who had become the unofficial mascot of all the camp, and his death severely shook Ike and Mamie's relationship to the Corps. For the rest of their lives, they never fully recovered from the loss but they persevered. Still grieving from the loss of his son, Ike was transferred back to the best of the mind-numbing bureaucratic positions in, in more glamorous sites. He was now sent to pre-air-conditioned Panama with housing that uh, included such guests as bats, rats, cockroaches, and snakes, and where contracting dysentery and malaria was still a fairly common occurrence. His marriage was jeopardized when Mamie, after seeing the living conditions in Panama, 
turned around and went home to be with her family in cooler, less vermin-infested Colorado. Thousands of miles now from the woman who meant so much to him, Ike toiled in another dead-end assignment. None of this made sense to him, but it seems as if there might have been a God who knew what lay ahead. And Ike, rather than leaving the Army with a bitter heart, continued to persevere. A senior officer, Fox Connor, seeing Ike's loneliness, befriended him and loaned him, like the Abilene publisher had done so many years ago, loaned him his library of military history and geographic books. And Ike became a serious student of these things. And from then until his death, he became an avid reader, became a master of history and geography, sometimes reading three to four books a week. Thankfully, Mamie courageously rejoined him, but they continued to endure terrible pay, rugged living conditions, and substandard housing, perhaps not as bad as Panama, but worse than most of us today can imagine. But despite these challenges, in every position, Ike was a top performer, an officer whose commanding officers could count on and hated to see him move on. We even found in the uh, letters in the library an instance where a commander had tried to downrate him to keep him from being transferred because they wanted to retain him. But the respect of superiors don't always make lousy assignments better. For a while, he was seemingly in more demand as an Army football coach than as a military officer. In his memoirs, he wrote about one such assignment. He said, why was I moved to join three other officers in a football coaching assignment? It's still a cosmic top secret wonder to me. <laughs> but he persevered. And finally, a breakthrough came. He was selected to attend the Army's Command and Staff College, where his years of intense self-study paid off, graduating first in his class thanks to very hard work and also the help of the notes of his buddy, George Patton, who had been there before him. After graduation in 1928, he agreed to take an assignment in France, mostly to honor his wife, who had endured so much for him. The Battlefield Monuments Commission needed an updated guidebook to document the sacrifices on the First World War's battle locations for the families of fallen to locate where fathers and sons and brothers had been lost. Not a command position, but once again, he performed a task that made no sense for career with absolute excellence. But it would make a lot of sense later because Ike trekked across the battlefields of France. He came to know much of the nation's terrain like the back of his hand. And years later, he was even known to correct maps from his own experience of how the terrain had changed from the topography that had been uh, before World War I and after. Then he and Mamie returned to Washington, D.C., and again, instead of a command, he now became a researcher, a speechwriter, and a plan developer for others. He is now almost 40 years old, and after two decades of going places he didn't want to go, doing jobs he didn't want to do, seeing others get the plum jobs and desirable assignments, he even more firmly appeared to be going nowhere. And though discouraged, he remained faithful. Though grumbling a bit privately, he never seriously considered quitting, and his performance became even more excellent. What Ike did not know, because no one had said so, was that others were noticing his performance, his attitude, and noting him as a future leader. Some of those noticing had names like Pershing, Connor, and Marshall. And a funny thing happened. Things got even worse. His commanding officer, General Douglas MacArthur, got crossways with President Franklin Roosevelt and was sent packing from his post as Army Chief of Staff here in D.C. to oversee the rebuilding of the fledgling Army of the Philippines, but without enough resources to do so. Ike followed, spending the next years mired in more tedious detail, and for a while without Mamie again, who had stayed back in the States. One of his duties extended to finding poker players for the autocratic general's evening card game, or if he couldn't, filling in as a player himself. When you're required to play, you become a very adept poker player. He also lost his best friend there while in a tragic aviation accident. And then after his wife was finally able to join him, he almost lost her when she suffered a ruptured blood vessels after a particularly rough car ride to visit their son at school there in the Philippines. But still, he hung in, 
He did not resign like many prideful officers would have done. He served quietly, humbly, and well. He never said a job was not within his description or beneath his dignity, and he did whatever he was asked to do, and he excelled. He persevered. He developed a deep relationship with the President of the Philippines and learned the art of diplomacy, which would be so important later. In fact, he said during several uh, months of his command of the uh, broader armed forces that he actually spent more time as a diplomat than he did as a soldier. And God, of course, even used those uh, poker games as training because all of the uh, naval and uh, army command of that era passed through the Philippines as they traveled through the world. And as they said at that poker table, he learned a lot about their character. He returned to the U.S. in 1939 to another series of staff position. Though his permanent remain, rank remained as lieutenant colonel, he was awarded the temporary uh, star as a brigadier general. And he was appointed to help lead the Third Army during the massive war games in Louisiana. His presentations were inspired, his planning was so detailed, his performance so high that the other officers in the command noted he was on his way up. And now at the age, ripe old age of 51, things began to fit together in his life. That tank camp at Gettysburg learning to lead, those hot lonely nights in Panama mastering world history and geography, that arduous truck convoy across country seeing the shortfall of America's transportation, the busy walk of walking France, learning its terrain, and the tedious years of staff work and planning and putting his own ambitions, his own dreams aside to serve an autocratic poker playing general to learn the personalities of the U.S. command. It all fell into place with the horror of December 7th, 1941. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you this important bulletin from the United Press. Flash, Washington. The White House announces Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. And with that, the United States, of course, entered World War II. And Ike, who for 26 years had persevered, who'd been preparing so patiently and brilliantly, was summoned to Washington, D.C. There, though he'd never held a combat command, because of the brilliance, again, of his planning, he was assigned Operation Torch to liberate the peoples of North Africa from the oppression of the National Socialists and the Italian Axis, Germany and Italy, and the prelude to the liberation and restoration of freedom in Europe. Now, looking back through the lens of history, the Allied successes seemed like a sure thing, but it was far from that for those that lived in that era. In 1941, it appeared that much of the world would remain enslaved under socialism for a long, long time. In the early months of the unwanted war, disaster was in every headline, every newsreel, and every letter sent from lonely soldiers at the front. But Ike and America knew for freedom to be restored and civilization to flourish, America had to learn to fight. Before this nation entered the fray, Great Britain, the continent of Europe, and most of Asia lay under siege. And by 1941, England stood alone. The Brits watched the bloodshed across the channel as the armies of Hitler and Stalin blew out the lights of freedom in one country after another. And the loss of freedom was horrendous, really beyond most of our comprehension today. So when Ike's troops landed in North Africa, they learned to fight, but it was very difficult. The kill ratio, please listen to this. The kill ratio was one allied death for every nine feet of ground gained across that massive continent. So basically from here to Craig, one person died all the way across that incredible continent. America and allied troops bled and died for the peoples of Africa, for the world, leaving behind 27 acres of headstones in Tunisia alone. Now, like most wars, the American public had no idea the vastness of the human toll, the sacrifice required. But in the midst of these horrors, God was at work in Ike's life as he learned that faith and perseverance coupled with adequate supplies were keys to ending the oppression. And those lessons laid the foundation for liberating Europe. The general's dedication and his perseverance against all odds provided valuable time for the industrial might of the U.S. to kick in, for the training camps back home to build and equip those who would fight for freedom. And those young troops, green, uncertain, and untested, marched across Africa, then to Sicily, then up through Italy, willing to give all to
to persevere for those they would never know. But even as things looked up, with finally more victories than losses, Ike remained ever humble. Never was he too proud to admit error. He actually openly studied and asked staff to work with him to study his mistakes, to refine the strategies of freedom as they went forward. That allied sacrifice and their perseverance held the door open, buying time for the allies to end the human oppression of Hitler's socialism. All of that sacrifice and perseverance were only a prelude to that June D-Day of the 6th of June, 1944, whose outcome was far, far from certain. Reviewing the final plans to liberate Europe, Ike said, we've got a contingency for everything, everything but failure. And if the armies fail, it's my fault, not theirs. And he put it in writing. The pressures were inhuman. But he knew that if the Normandy invasion failed, it would be a year or more before the Allies could try again. In that year, most remaining Jews would be eliminated. Hitler's jet plane and rocket programs would further develop. Some of you have heard about the Tuskegee Airmen. You may not know when they were in those battles as a prelude to the landing at Sicily. They faced German planes that had a capacity to fly 100 miles an hour faster than the US fighter planes at that time and yet they still made that incredible uh, progress. They, I knew that countless more innocents would die, and it would be incredibly difficult if things failed. So with this understanding, quick to give credit, to make stars of others, Ike would not blame others or throw them under the bus if his plans failed. Firm in his faith, he took it on his shoulders. But despite the endless preparations, the unbearable stress, Ike knew there was someone bigger than him in control. It was not the soldier from the dusty streets of Abilene, but it was a God in heaven, much greater than any man. After he gave the order to proceed on that June morning, Ike said, Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. I could later say they came to storm the beaches for one purpose only, not to gain anything for ourselves, not to fulfill any ambitions, not for conquest, but just to preserve freedom. As Ike led his men in prayer, countless Americans were also praying back home. Despite the revisionist history today, and you can imagine the lawsuits the ACLU would bring, government offices, schools, factories came to a halt in thousands of towns like the Gettysburg, Pennsylvania newspaper illustrates. Countless Invasion Day prayer services were held in tax-funded public buildings and places. And the President of the United States himself led the nation in prayer. My fellow Americans, last night when I spoke with you about the fall of Rome, I knew at that moment that troops of the United States and our allies were crossing the channel in another and greater operation. And so, in this poignant hour, 
I ask you to join with me in prayer. Almighty God, our sons, pride of our nation, this day have set upon a mighty endeavor, a struggle to preserve our republic, our religion, and our civilization, and to set free a suffering humanity. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness in their faith. They will need thy blessings. Their road will be long and hard. Help us, almighty God, to rededicate ourselves in renewed faith in thee in this hour of great sacrifice. I ask that our people devote themselves in a continuance of prayer as we rise to each new day and again when each day is spent let words of prayer be on our lips, invoking thy help to our efforts. And, O oh Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in thee, faith in our sons, faith in each other, faith in our united crusade. With thy blessing, we shall prevail over the unholy forces of our enemy. Thy will be done, almighty God. That might be a very Amen. Useful, that might be a very useful prayer these days. God answered the prayers of the nation, and he rewarded Ike's perseverance and reliance on him. As we all know, victory came on those bloody beaches of Normandy, that it would take another year for the oppressed people of Western Europe to again smell the sweet our sweet air of freedom. And in victory, our then president, Harry S. Truman, again called upon Americans to pray, but this time a proclamation to give thanks and praise to God. But as to Ike, his nation service, his service to our nation and his fellow man was far, far from over. In November 1952, after he had served tours of duty as Army Chief of Staff, as president of Columbia University in New York, the supreme commander of the North American Treaty Organization, the poor boy from Abilene who had never owned a house or a car, was overwhelmingly elected the 34th president of the United States. At his inaugural, as no other president has ever done before or since, he interrupted the proceedings to pray a prayer he himself had written, prepared in his hotel room just before he left to assume the presidency. My friends, before I begin the expression of those thoughts that I deem appropriate uh, to this moment, would you permit me the privilege of uttering a little private prayer of my own? And I ask that you bow your heads. Almighty God, as we stand here at this moment, my associates in the, my future associates in the executive branch of government join me in beseeching that thou will make full and complete our dedication to the service of the people in this throng and their fellow citizens everywhere. Give us, we pray, the power to discern clearly right from wrong and allow all our words and actions to be governed thereby and by the laws of this land. Especially we pray that our concern shall be for all the people, regardless of station, race, or calling. May cooperation be permitted and be the mutual aim of those who, under the concepts of our Constitution, hold to differing political faiths, so that all may work for the good of our beloved country and thy glory. Amen. And you notice he said the precepts of our Constitution for those at the Heritage Foundation. Before he composed that prayer, which he'd actually asked Billy Graham to help him with, and Graham declined, he said, if you're going to pray a prayer, it has to be yours. Ike told the members of his soon-to-be cabinet, I don't want to deliver a sermon, 
But I firmly believe our government, and the first thing we must remember about it, is a deeply embedded basis in religious faith. Ike's carefully composed prayer was only the beginning. His entire speech was filled with references to affirming religious faith, our heritage, and natural law. He said, when we find ourselves groping to know the full sense and meaning of these times in which we live, in our quest for understanding, we beseech God's guidance. We who are free must proclaim anew our faith, governed by eternal moral and natural laws. It establishes beyond debate those gifts of the Creator that are men's inalienable rights and that make all men equal in His sight. The faith that we hold belongs not to us alone, but to the free of the world. And then He warned us, a people that values its privileges above its principles soon loses both. Later that month, speaking at Columbia University's campus, he sung, summed up the eternal struggle of freedom against evil, the evil he witnessed at Dachau and Buchenwald from the National Socialist death camps when his troops liberated them, the evil he would face as president standing up to the murderous socialist reigns of Stalin, Khrushchev, Castro, and Mao Zedong that eventually cost the world 100 million human lives, and the ongoing struggle against evil and for human freedom and flourishing even to this day. He said, this is a war of light against darkness, freedom against slavery, godliness against atheism. It is first national prayer breakfast, which he launched, held in 1953 and held every year since. He said, personal prayer, it seems to me, is one of the simple necessities of life, is basic to the individual, is sunshine, food, and water, and at times, of course, more so. A thousand experiences have convinced me beyond room for doubt that prayer multiplies the strength of the individual and brings within the scope of his capabilities almost any conceivable objective. Days after becoming president, when no votes were to be obtained, Ike was baptized, confirmed, and enrolled at the National Presbyterian Church in Washington, D.C., and Ike served his nation well. One particular area of concern, which has been focus of another good book, was civil rights. After his experiences in the military, particularly those of African-American descent, as I mentioned earlier, he had seen the Tuskegee Airmen take on the so-called super race of the Nazis and bring them to quarter. He had brought uh, African-American troops into participation for the Battle of the Bulge and integrated them with other troops and saw the uh, incredible ability that these people who had been denied so much had. And he was outraged by many of the evil things he had observed, and he was committed that all Americans would enjoy the Declaration's promises of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And he quietly fought powerful forces to see the passage of the first Civil Rights Voting Act, the first such law passed since Reconstruction, and he directed the peaceful de desegregation of Washington, D.C. When Arkansas's governor ordered his National Guard to block nine African-American students from attending Central High in Little Rock, Ike trumped him. He called out the 101st Airborne Division to ensure that the black students' safety was ensured, but their freedom, more importantly, as well. We might remember the 101st was the Airborne Division that landed behind Utah Beach at San Mira Glace. He was quite familiar with their proficiency, and uh, he wasn't fiddling around when he sent them down to Arkansas. When the governor of South Carolina refused to allow the Reverend Dr. Billy Graham to hold a rally at the steakhouse because of Dr. Graham's strong stand against racism, Ike rose to his defense, and he invited Graham to hold his crusade on the nearby Fort Jackson Army base instead. Where was the ACLU? Remember his truck convoy at the lightning pace of six miles an hour? The memory of that toiling trek and seeing Germany's modern auto bonds that were used to move the socialist war machine inspired the interstate and defense highway system, the freeways we all enjoy and could not imagine life without. His national defense policies prevented nuclear war. He fostered development of the first Earth-orbiting Earth satellites. He ushered Alaska and Hawaii into statehood. He brought the St. Lawrence Seaway to completion and he created NASA to provide civilian leadership in our exploration of space and so much more. All things we could not imagine life without today. Ike was also, uh, as I said, a detailed planner on many things. and It was meticulous planning 
that led to many of his uh, appointments and successes, but one area that uh, he himself took blame and said it were the worst things he did in his administration were some bad judicial appointments. He didn't have a heritage foundation. He didn't have a Federalist Society or an alliance defending freedom to assist him. Uh, Eisenhower appointed 183 Article III judges during his two terms, and he appointed five Supreme Court justices, two of whom he said were the worst things he had ever done in his entire life. One who had made the Chief Justice, he said, was his singular greatest mistake of his entire career. But I submit that his superb record on many other areas would probably have been even more successful if he had had help from heritage. He signed legislation putting under God into our Pledge of Allegiance and the words in God we trust on our paper money. Remember Lincoln had put it on the coins and Eisenhower brought it to the paper. And just a couple of weeks ago, you probably saw the Supreme Court upheld the retention of that phrase on our paper money. He was uh, involved in so many of the things that we could uh, spend an entire talk just on more accomplishments of his administration. But I like to note that for eight years, he led as he'd promised every cabinet meeting to open in prayer. One of my favorite little anecdotes is on a rare occasion, he had been out with a heart attack, some health challenges, and uh, he actually let the cabinet meeting start without prayer. And one of his aides is, you know, you can probably imagine how this was. Mr. Mr. President, you, you, you forgot the prayer. And he said, we forgot the goddamn prayer. <laughs> I think uh, the general trumped the president at that point. But uh, God's place in his life was not mere rhetoric, but the essence of the man. In 1955, he told the American Legion this, without God, there cannot be an American form of government, nor an American way of life. Recognition of the supreme being is the first and most basic expression of Americanism. After he left the White House, he became involved in home churches in Gettysburg, and even once he preached a Sunday sermon there to the local presbytery on religious liberty. What happened, he was out, uh, he had a, a kind of a habit going out with his pastor during the week to have a cup of coffee and a little chat. And uh, they would talk about the sermon, different things, and he was unloading on the Supreme Court on the prayer case that had come down. And the pastor said, well, why don't you, uh, why don't you talk about it in church on Sunday? So he wrote a sermon, and he delivered a blistering sermon uh, on the Warren Court uh, and uh, the mistakes he'd made. He said he could not envision any way with our history and our Constitution that such an outrageous ruling could have come down from our courts. And in every city he lived in during different seasons of the year, he had a special church that he was in every time the doors were open that his health permitted. He even got into the cornerstone laying business. He laid one in here in D.C. for the National Presbyterian Church when it moved. He laid the cornerstone for Reed Memorial Church down in Augusta, Georgia, where his friends at the uh, little-known uh, golf course known as Augusta National, where that small tournament the Masters played. And he laid the cornerstone for the National Council of Churches headquartered in New York. He also helped raise the money for Mamie's Church in uh, Denver to build a new building, and he donated the pulpit that is in use even to this day. But after a rich and full life, his later years spent with his grandchildren and Mamie in Gettysburg and on the golf courses of Augusta Palm Springs in Denver. He entered Walter Reed Hospital here in DC with a failing heart and he never checked out. At the very end, he said to his family, I wanna go, God take me. He died on March 28, 1969. That was my senior year in high school. And I took a, a was assigned by my school paper to take pictures of the uh, flags at half-mast, and I popped on my bike to take pictures like this uh, photographic masterpiece. Uh, this uh, NBC News brief will tell you something about how the country thought of him at that time. General Eisenhower died today. His death was peaceful and natural. He was 78 years old, and it was the end of a life so filled with accomplishment and achievement and honors that even though it was a long life, it could hardly have held any more. Down to the end, he remained one of the most popular of all Americans. Last year, it was widely said, and perhaps accurately, that if he had been a little younger and healthier, and had it been legally possible, he could have been elected president again. 
Looking back, it's easy to take a humble life like Ike's of perseverance, endurance, faithfulness, and servant leadership who made stars of countless others for granted. And understanding how he came to depend on his maker and to talk about it, regardless of how lousy the circumstances, and how he grew to understand the Lord's plans for his life and let God be in charge. You can understand why some of the secular media of today pushes such memories aside. And that is why Craig and I wrote the book. He was one of Ronald Reagan's greatest heroes. He's one of mine, and I hope now he may be one of yours. Ike did not set out as a child to free millions from tyranny or become president of the United States. He simply set out to serve, to find his way forward. He had no roadmap showing him where to go or where to turn. He can no more see his future than you or I can right now. His path was never easy. And along the way, he was dealt many bad hands. He faced treachery, jealousy, hatred from peers and supposed allies, as year, well as years of physical and emotional exhaustion. Of this, he said, after spending seven score years in life's battles and half a century in America's service, I carry numbers of scars and marks of this struggle, including the ultimate of human rights struggles. But Ike never gave up. He never surrendered. He persevered. And along the way, he learned he had no better option than to call out and to get on his knees and to fully trust God. Ike's wisdom and guidance still influences our world even now. A recent poll of presidential historians placed him fifth as the greatest president of all time, citing his moral authority as his biggest asset. So I would challenge us to be like Ike. Let's persevere through the hills and the valleys, the joys and the sorrows, and let us seek to follow his will, and in so doing, let us protect freedom's future, our heritage, and in so doing, impact eternity. We hope you enjoy the book that tells you much of what was behind the different aspects of this journey. We uh, spent a lot of time, as Tim said, in, in presidential libraries in different locations where he lived his rich and full life. He left a lot of trail and a lot of evidence about his faith. And we hope that uh, the book, which uh, all of you now have, will uh, lead you to uh, respect and greatly admire this aspect of his life. So thank you, bless you all, and I think we're now gonna answer some questions. Alan, thank you for that outstanding uh, talk. One of the best that I think uh, all of us have ever been privileged to hear. That was, was, was just great. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned in my opening uh, comments, again, to the timely, topical, relevant part, uh, that uh, just six blocks from where we're sitting, uh, the Eisenhower Memorial is being prepared. Uh, I might say not without a little controversy here in Washington, <laughs> which uh, some of you may have followed. Uh, now, after your presentation, uh, it will be very interesting to see whether the memorial makers and the monument makers, uh, which is, of course, uh, unmistakable at the Lincoln Memorial, unmistakable at the Jefferson Memorial, uh, un uh, unmistakable at both Mount Vernon and in the very top of the Washington Monument, whether the monument and memorial makers will not miss the president's faith. Uh, and unfortunately, in, 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 uh, in Washington, uh, that has sometimes been the case. We surely hope they won't. And I might just note for those, uh, you know, in the cover of the book, we say with Ryan Cole. Ryan did some research for us. Ryan uh, spent a number of years working with Mitch Daniels and others. But uh, Ryan's father, his late father, served on the Eisenhower Memorial Commission. Uh, in the midst of uh, your very understated comment, controversy. Yes. I, I, I might pick up just moderator's privilege, and then we'll open it up. Uh, you made a very interesting observation that nothing has meaning without context. That's, that's, that's quite, quite deep. Um, in light of Eisenhower's life, um, what about faith in his home when he was growing up? Question one. Question two, this remarkable reference you made uh, to uh, his baptism. Uh, you know, uh, at, the, at the very cusp of his presidency. I think both of those things are things that, that all of us would benefit from learning more about. Well, Eisenhower was raised in a river, uh, what was called a River Brethren faith. 
and that's where his parents came from. We trace through the whole heritage in the book, in the first chapter of the book. Unfortunately, at a certain point, during that, in his childhood, his parents lost one of his sons. And fortunately, his mother diverted off into what was called the Bible student movement, which later became known as Jehovah's Witnesses. However, neither Eisenhower or any of his brothers, none of them ever embraced that. But it, created a, but it did create a, a major tension with his mother because Jehovah's Witnesses are pacifists. They didn't also you know, do not believe in the pledge of, you know, standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Then you form a patriotism. So there was this tension throughout Eisenhower's life with the faith that his mother in, you know, embraced yeah. and so forth, even though none of the, the other members of his, you know, his brothers ever embraced that faith which would then play itself out during the presidential election, which we talk about. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and may I say, and what about the question of baptism uh, in, here in Washington? Well, what was interesting was on the baptism issue is because the Weather Brethren faith did not believe in infant baptism, so Eisenhower was never baptized as a child. Well, so it came time, you know, during the way up to the presidential election, he was talking with people like Claire Booth Luce and Dr. You know, Reverend Billy Graham and others, and then Dr. Edward Elson, who was the pastor of National Presbyterian Church. And Eisenhower had never belonged to a church. It wasn't because of a lack of faith, but when you're in the military, you're moving around all over the place. Sometimes you're only there for a month or two and you're on to another station, so you can't dedicate yourself really to a body. And so they all emphasized, and Eisenhower agreed, that he needed to join a church. And after talking with Dr. Graham and talking with Reverend Elson and knowing that Mamie had come from a Presbyterian background, he, they all agreed that National Presbyterian, which was a solid Bible-believing teaching church, would be the best place for him to be. Well, one thing, if you're going to join a membership of the Presbyterian church, you need to be baptized into the Presbyterian, into the Christian faith, and into the Presbyterian church. But Eisenhower was very insistent that this would not happen until after he was elected president, because for him, the faith was a very personal thing, and he had seen, and like we've seen with so many others, how faith has been used for political purposes, that, oh, all of a sudden, it's six months before the election, I need to lock down the faith vote, so I better start going to church and saying the right things from the poll, you know, from the campaign stump. Eisenhower said, I just can't do that. That would make me a total hypocrite. And so he insisted that the baptism not happen, and he did not join the church until after his inauguration. And then, so the first Sunday he goes to church, and the Washington Post puts it on the front page, and he gets livid because he says, I do not want this publicized, even though it's Washington, D.C. You can't help the fact that the Washington, D.C. press knows something like this. They're going to report it. And he got very mad at Dr. Elson, who probably couldn't do much about it. The press is going to find out what they find out, but just showed how it's genuineness of his faith. And then to top it off, uh, this won't sound at all familiar to you all in D.C. today. After he uh, did this, after he objected, he didn't want publicity. Then he was accused of doing it for publicity purposes by a member of the opposing party in the U.S. Senate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> We're eager to open it up for a couple of questions. We'll be mindful of everyone's time. Yes, sir, here in the front. Yes, yes, we are, and it's on the way. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Carl Golovin, as a avid reader, would uh, President Eisenhower have uh, come across or have ever written in his letters about a, a very uh, widely read book at the time, in 1952, titled The Iron, Curren, Iron Curtain Across America by John Beatty, B-E-A-T-Y. He was a military intelligence person. It was widely endorsed by many in the military, and it delved into the, the history of a thousand years of the roots of both Bolshevism, communism, and Zionism as being intertwined and ultimately serving uh, shared objectives. Um, did he ever read that, to your knowledge? I, that book does not ring a bell from uh, mm -hmm. our rather extensive research and reading. He Obviously, as I said, he read three to four books a week. And so if this was something being commonly discussed among the command, he probably was uh, generally aware of it, but I can't speak specifically to it. 
Another question? Yes, sir. My name is Seth Lucas. Uh, thank you both for uh, helping uncover this gemstone of American history. It just helps us kind of bring into perspective a lot of how that treasure of the secret place, as scripture speaks of, can flow out and impact so many lives. So thank you for uncovering that for us. Um, and my question is, uh, among Christian academia, there's a lot of debate about uh, things like this where people get up and present their faith in public. And I've heard um, some men that I really respect present arguments such as, oh, statements like these where he's bringing faith into the public square are just an example of use of a private faith to kind of create a like an American faith that doesn't really have any depth, but it's just there to kind of pro provide a cohesive movement against some force that we are combating. Or ranging from that point saying, that was a bad thing. They shouldn't have done that. Um, it was wrong for them to take their personal faith and turn it into a politicized thing, which Eisenhower, obviously, you've just pointed out, it was very much against. But how would you answer those who are saying his use of faith in such a patriotic way was wrong, that it was incorrect of him to use it on such a public form, even if it was permissible? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at it because this is, again, this goes... This is uh, 204 pages of discussion. But uh, very quickly, first of all, if you'd like to read somebody else's thoughts on this relating to our book, James Carafano here at the Heritage wrote an excellent piece in the National Interest. Uh, the title of his article is Why God Liked Ike, Religion Belongs in American Foreign Policy. And the essence of it for him was not to use it, not to adopt it as something as a strategy because, as we said, he avoided it in the campaign. He actually was the only, he was the first person to have ever run for president that we know of that did not have a relationship with a local church. Remember, even Thomas Jefferson, the least religious of all, held worship services at the Capitol with the Marine Band providing the music. But uh, he truly believed uh, this. Let me read you just a couple of his own words about this. He said, the only hope for the world as we know it will be complete spiritual regeneration. He said, free government cannot be explained in any other terms but religious. Our founding fathers had to refer to the creator in order to make their revolutionary experiment make sense. Uh, he, he talked about, the again, the war between the light and the dark, the atheism of communism, socialism, and uh, America's uh, godly heritage. And he said that we have to work to strengthen our spiritual weapons. And, uh, and, and one of the things we describe in the book is a little encounter, a little testy between him and Claire Booth Luce, because she was one of those who said, how could you do this without being part of a church and so forth? And he finally just said, Claire, do you think I could have fought my way through the war, ordered thousands of fellows to their death, if I couldn't have gone down on my knees and talked with God and begged him to support me and make me feel what I was doing was right for myself and the world, why I could not have lived a day without God. Mm -hmm. uh, this is, so I think the first thing, the first answer is that his faith was very deep and real, and he saw that, the, that what America had to do was go back to its basis if it was to win the Cold War that if we were to preserve freedom, you know, I always remember Ronald Reagan's first inaugural, I think it's on the wall somewhere in Heritage, in 1968 when he said in Sacramento, freedom uh, only lasts for this generation. Each generation's duty is to pass it on to the next one. And this is something that Eisenhower understood. He was there in Dachau. He, you know, remember what happened in Dachau? That's where they brought the, not only the, the horrible uh, treatment of the Jews, that's where they brought the Catholic priests. They had this special dormitory for the priests. And the Carmelite Titus Bramsa, you know, they made the medical experiments on him. On and on. He saw the evidence of this. He's the guy who said, bring the cameras in here. Bring the filmmakers. Let's preserve this evidence forever so that nobody can ever deny what godliness does to a country. Mm -hmm. he, he had seen it. And uh, so maybe I'm getting a little impassioned, but this was not a user. This was a guy who, from the depths of his soul, understood there was really no other hope uh, for the future of the country. And so he said, as president, I've got to lead in this direction.
And so my, my, I guess my number one answer to the critics would be, uh, if God build America, God bless us. But if we abandon him, he's no longer going to protect us. And I, I would add to that, first of all, if you read his inaugural address from 1953, it comes very clear that he understood the principles upon what our nation was founded. But the other thing that was interesting is that Alan had mentioned in his speech his outrage over the Supreme Court decisions of 61, 62, banning school prayer and so forth. And being so outraged, he went and spoke to the local presbytery about it. And if you read that, and we put excerpts of that in the book, it shows how his anger was the fact that we are forgetting our spiritual heritage, and the spiritual heritage will now no longer be passed down to our children and our grandchildren, the, the spiritual heritage upon which our nation was founded. Uh, it's very interesting, Alan and Craig, in light of what you've just said. Uh, you know, other war presidents, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, uh, ultimately having this observation, having been war presidents, having been there and seen things, that the will of God prevails. Uh, you know, that, that, that providence is real, uh, and very real in the life of a nation, in the deepest DNA and marrow of the country. Uh, Eisenhower seems to be, you know, re reflecting that uh, in some of the comments you shared. We have time for uh, one more, I think, and we'll ask uh, this gentleman who's uh, sitting in the front row. Mike's on the way. Yes, sir. Ambassador. All right. Thank you. I might be the only one in, in, in the audience who uh, actually um, got to know President Eisenhower. I was his um, youngest appointee. And the thing that I think impressed me the most was his humility. Um, and he was such a nice guy. And he took an interest in <clears throat> in... Me, um, I got to know him. I was in his campaign, and then a couple of years later, I joined the administration uh, as a special assistant to the Secretary of Commerce. <clears throat> and it was so interesting when you pointed out uh, on the on the terrible road trip that he had and and stuff. And the Secretary of Commerce <clears throat> uh, Weeks was uh, always had a couple of us his assistant and the general counsel uh, meet with him after uh, the cabinet meetings. And so one day he comes in and he says, well, uh, we've got a new assignment. And he talked about how the president talked about the bad roads and how he was going to launch the uh, uh, interstate highway system. And uh, <clears throat> he said, uh, why don't we get the uh, head of the transportation uh, the department here and uh, tell him what his new job is going to be. <laughs> so um, all in all, I thought that <clears throat> um, and Eisenhower took an interest in young men like myself. Um, and when he found out I was running for Congress, it was right after his administration. Um, he had me come down to uh, uh, to uh, Gettysburg several times. And people said, oh, you know, Eisenhower doesn't know politics and things. He knew politics, and he got me $100,000. At that time, that was a huge sum of money. And um, he was, as uh, people say, and now the fifth president, a really nice guy. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. The great, uh, great uh, way to close our time together, uh, but not uh, before uh, a book signing. Uh, and we know that uh, everybody here, Alan and Craig, will be interested in buying several dozen copies of your great book. Uh, the book, again, is called The Soul of an American President, The Untold Story of Dwight D. Eisenhower's Faith. And our time together at Heritage today has uh, featured our co-authors, Alan Sears and Craig Ostin. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you.